Hindenburg described the operation as the one completely successful enterprise on either side in which an army and a fleet cooperated. The execution of our plans was rendered so doubtful by bad weather at the outset that we were already thinking of disembarking the troops on board. The arrival of better weather then enabled us to proceed with the venture. From that point, everything went like clockwork. We succeeded in possessing ourselves of Urzel and the neighboring islands. One more pressure was thus added to the sense of crisis in the capital. In Petrograd and at the front, Bolshevik agitators worked tirelessly. Soldiers, do not trust these wolves in sheep's clothing. They call you to fresh slaughter. Well, follow them if you like. Let them pave the path for the return of the bloody Tsar with your corpses. Let your orphans, your widows and children, deserted by all, pass again into slavery, hunger, beggary and disease. The Bolshevik following multiplied. Lenin himself returned secretly to supervise the insurrection. On November the 7th, in a superb stroke of political bluff, Trotsky simply proclaimed that the provisional government had fallen and that all power belonged to the Soviet. 20,000 Red Guards appeared on the streets. Bolshevik oratory and subversion worked among the troops. During the next few days, Trotsky's statement became an accomplished fact. The Bolsheviks besieged the Winter Palace, where the provisional government was protected only by a handful of officer cadets and a women's battalion. In a matter of hours, the Bolsheviks captured the palace and arrested the provisional government. The provisional government, like the Tsar before it, had fallen without a struggle. Now Lenin could honor his promise of peace. An armistice was arranged with the Germans, and Russian emissaries went to meet them at Brest-Litovsk. The two sides made a strange contrast. The Germans, stiff, correct, experienced, apparently with all the cards in their hands. The Russians, nervous, uncertain, but with at least one good card. They could play for time. To counter the ever-tightening stranglehold of the Allied blockade, the Germans and Austrians desperately needed access to the vast granaries of the Ukraine. They therefore made a separate peace with the independent, anti-Bolshevik government of the Ukraine. A peace treaty with Romania, now near the end of her tether, followed. But there was no peace with Russia. The endless Bolshevik delaying tactics enraged the Germans. They resumed their advance into Russia. The Russian army made no attempt to stop them. Instead, it fell back in a rabble. War is dead in the hearts of men, noted an American observer. The Bolsheviks were forced to accept the harshest terms of peace. The Eastern Front was finished.
Hindenburg said, In spite of the conclusion of peace with Russia, it was even now impossible for us to transfer all our effective troops from the east. It was absolutely necessary for us to leave behind strong German forces. Our operations in the Ukraine were not yet at an end. We had to penetrate into their country to restore order there. Only when this had been done had we any prospect of securing food from the Ukraine. Of a very different import was the military assistance which in the spring we sent to Finland in her war of liberation from Russian domination. The Bolshevik government had not fulfilled the promise it had made us to evacuate this country. We hoped by assisting Finland to get her on our side. The rest of our fighting troops, which still remained in the east, formed the source from which our western armies could be reinforced. Now the patient, enduring German army might at last bring off the decisive victory which had escaped its grasp. The troop trains rumbled across Europe, bearing division after division from east to west. Every click of their wheels echoed the ticking away of precious time. For Germany, it was now or never. <laughs> 